Welcome. My name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled Architectural Programming for the Learner. ASEP is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEP provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEP online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's podcast, Ms. Ann Taylor. Ms. Taylor is a professor emeria in the School of Architecture at the University of New Mexico. In addition, Ms. Taylor is internationally known as an author and presenter committed to helping others transform school physical environments into learning teaching tools, or in her words, a three-dimensional textbook. Again, it is my honor to present to you Ms. Ann Taylor. Thank you, Ms. Taylor, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Today's podcast is about programming and planning, the process for school facility design. There are 10 sections to this podcast that explore a way to plan school facilities using developmental needs or rights of clients, which are the students, as design determinants for learning environments of the future. There are 10 sections to this talk. The first section is a short discussion on curriculum content and instructional strategies as a basis for planning schools. The second section is a summary of developmental needs and rights in a continuum of the education of body, mind, and spirit. Section three are levels of habitability, the translation of developmental rights into activity settings that are derived from Maslow's levels of human functioning and translated into habitability levels. The fourth section will examine the steps in programming design and building for new ideas of what a school can be, especially in the future. Section five are examples of translated environmental manifestations that can be used as teaching tools. And section six is a six-step taxonomy of learning a systems method of learning from the environment. Section 7 tells about examples of manifestations for learning using the idea of looking at a material thing and realizing what the systems or ideas behind it govern it. And examples are a pond, artificial lighting, and weeds in the parking lot. Section 8 are tools for learning. We'll discuss tools for learning. And section nine is about a learning environment assessment with different categories for looking at classrooms. And section 10 are summary comments. Section one necessitates looking at man, woman, and child as part of the environment, not apart from it. Therefore, the environment is very, very important. And we can design environments based on the curriculum content the subject matter disciplines, interdisciplinary concepts, elements of architecture, manifestations for learning, art and design, project-based portfolio assessment. It also is based on the learning processes, how we learn, the developmental rights of all children, whether or not they are verbal, visual, mathematic, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, musical, or naturalistic, and have these as intelligence that are very diverse. And then the context for learning is the local geographic setting, the built natural and cultural environment. Why should schools in Hawaii look like schools in Michigan or Montana? We need to think about the cultural environment as a learning tool in the geography of the area where we design these schools. Section two, the developmental rights summary. In developing schools in the past, we have looked at square footage, predetermined square footage needs, and uh, budgets. I am positing that perhaps we should look at the developmental needs of our students, children through adults, and that it looks at a body, mind, and spirit continuum of development. 
and they are, in regard to the body, multisensory perception, gross motor development, using large muscles for many activities, fine motor development, using small muscles for manipulating objects, and wellness, health, safety, body systems, nutrition, and exercising. We have a plethora of overweight children in our culture, and we need to look at this one in particular to help produce healthy bodies, healthy minds, and healthy spirits. As far as the mind category, we have their concept development, experimenting and discovering and developing ideas across all disciplines, labeling, language and literacy and technical literacy, communicating verbally and with all the intelligences, cognition and creative problem solving, transferring and applying knowledge, sorting information, constructing, sequencing, thinking logically and so forth. Eco-literacy could also come under this category of mind, understanding ecological principles and natural patterns, networking, and so forth. The spirit is the third or the creative self-expression that we can enhance with dancing and drama, visual arts, music, etc. And cultural pluralism is also part of the creative spirit, valuing other cultures, understanding diversity, developing a sense of community and participating, valuing and stewardship also are a part of the spirit continuum, respecting all life forms, articulating likes and dislikes, and forming aesthetic judgments about things in the built, the natural, and the cultural environment. And lastly, the self and social development of ourselves. Healthy interaction, cooperating, sharing, teamwork, taking pride in accomplishments, and learning about emotions and developing a sense of self. Section 3, Architectural Habitability and the Developmental Rights of Learners. To explain this process of translation, I begin with an instrument that architect Wolf Prizer and I developed years ago to link educational and architectural needs during programming. The habitability framework is loosely based on levels of human functioning outlined by psychologist philosopher Abraham Maslow. Maslow listed a hierarchy of human motivations beginning with physiological needs such as hunger or thirst and reaching the highest level need for self-actualization or full realization of one's potential. And this continuum of habitability was adopted by Taylor and Prizer to translate the developmental needs of body into health and safety, mind or functional performance, and spirit or psychological comfort and aesthetic satisfaction. Physical learning needs are met at the health and safety level through adherence to codes and hygiene standards, avoidance of hazards and hazardous materials, etc. The mind is supported in the physical environment by adequate space, spatial relationships, adjacency, and communication systems, technology spaces that support changing educational delivery systems, multiple use, flexibility, adjustable lighting, storage and deployability, and ergonomics of furniture also support performance. The psychological comfort and aesthetic satisfaction, the third category of habitability, are enhanced through ambient qualities such as color, or natural lighting, sensory stimulation, privacy, places for reflection, accessibility, control, adaptability, meaning, cultural connections, and links to nature and beauty. Section 4. Steps in the Programming, Designing, and Building Process. We examine these so that we can look at new ideas of what a school can be. The steps define the general scope of work for a typical school facility project, but with a new focus on student-teacher learning and inclusion in the design process. First of all, inclusion of the learner in the programming and design process is an important point. First of all, there is client orientation. Quite often we have programming sessions with students who help us to gather data and to give us ideas about what they would like to see their school do. 
So you establish ties of communication and a common language, determine who will participate, select a representative stakeholder group from staff, students, and community, and introduce the entire architectural team and schedule the process. I would suggest having an architectural design center during this programming phase, and it is open to all suggestions and perhaps a big display of what is going to be considered in the process so that everybody can see and make notes on the wall and perhaps even have desks or tables with display items and lots of cards or paper for this programming process. Pre-programming begins with values and philosophy. Review alternative educational practices. Teach visual spatial thinking. Introduce architectural ideas for the future and review the budget and project delivery method. And create a general list of anticipated expenditures, if possible, and conduct master planning research, including siting and ecological criteria and green certification standards. The next is a site analysis. That's the third step. With student help, collect data on geophysical, biological, ecological, cultural, and regulatory aspects of the site, keeping in mind that the site can be used as a learning tool. The next step is programming. Examine the needs and wants with student, teacher, and parent input using the visual thinking skills they have been taught earlier in the process. Review architectural adequacy standards and translate developmental goals into activity settings. The next step is schematic drawing. Uncover preliminary design relationships and adjacencies. Make schematic drawings, sketches, and diagrams, and get feedback and refine the cost estimates. The next step is design development. Using architectural conventions of plan view, elevations, perspective drawings, and models, translate these activity settings into physical design determinants and offer increasingly detailed design solutions and budgeting and obtain stakeholder approvals. That's approval of students, teachers, community, administrators, etc. They've gone through the process. Now they're going to approve as far as you've gone. Then the construction documents, that's usually up to the architect to create large construction documents that contractors can use to build the structure. And then, of course, it goes out for bid, and contracts are made with the construction companies. And then, once the building is built, we need a user's guide. That's another step in the process to work with teachers and students to write and illustrate a document that can be used as a curriculum or as a tool for professional development. The user's guide describes the learning potential of the school based on the ideas uncovered during programming, educational standards of the school district, and objects built into the school as learning tools. And then the last thing that should occur, and quite often doesn't, is post-occupancy evaluating. Conducting a post-occupancy evaluation, or sometimes called a POE, is linked to the educational needs and programming criteria to determine the success of the design as perceived by users, architects, and evaluators representing groups such as the LEAD program. Be sure the POE addresses the effects of the building on learning. Section 5 explores specific examples translated from developmental needs to an activity setting. For instance, if we first look at the body and multi-sensory needs, We're looking at materials and color, textures, and ways of opening up the sensory mechanisms and helping children learn through their senses. The sense of smell, the sense of sight, the sense of hearing, the sense of taste, etc. In gross motor development, we want to see, as an example perhaps, a jogging trail around the school grounds where the gross motor development of children could happen, which might be combined with a nature trail. Learning how to skip, how to jump, how to run, how to do the many things that are needed for gross motor development. For fine motor development, such a thing as a doorknob, these are just examples, 
and you can think of many yourself, a doorknob for young children helps them to train their prehensile grasp to turn that knob and then to push or pull on it and so increasing their fine motor skills for manipulating the environment. Wellness and nutrition would translate into habitability for dining, let's say, with uh, family style, round tables. Maybe there's a garden built into the landscape design and with the jogging trail or the nature trail and the garden, we could set up a curriculum that looks at caloric input and exercise output. So the ratio of input and output are in balance. For the mind, there's concept development. We might need some interdisciplinary center for labeling and literacy. We need some signage in schools to explicate the architecture and the details that we are trying to get children to learn from, post beams, arches, etc., axes along the hallway, and wayfinding. Cognition and creative problem solving. We might design studios instead of classrooms and have them interconnected so that children can do some of their own learning and self-expression in these studios. Eco-literacy, we might design a greenhouse and have that as part of the eco-literacy program. For creative spirit, psychological comfort, aesthetic satisfaction, for creative self-expression, we need galleries and dance studios and music studios. For cultural pluralism, we need perhaps museums with the display of cultural realia, with perhaps the students being curators and taking care of that museum and learning how to be display exhibitors. For valuing and stewardship, we need beauty, not ugliness, in our schools and helping children to care for things, the earth, the plants, that help to produce better oxygen in a school. And lastly, the developmental need of social and self-development. Perhaps we design environments that are more conducive to teaming and also individualism. So there you have it, translating the developmental needs into habitability. Those are just a few of the examples. There are many, many, many more, and I'm sure you can think of them too. Section 6 is a approach to learning, a taxonomy that is geared to experiential learning. And there are six steps. One is the observation and multisensory discovery, using your senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and recording what is observed. Data collection is the second item. Counting, measuring, mapping, questioning, interviewing, concept formation and literacy in all disciplines, visual, spatial, and verbal thinking, literacy, language development, and so forth. The fourth area is creative problem solving and can be based on the scientific method but applied to all disciplines such as defining the problem or realizing a, having a felt difficulty, forming a hypothesis, testing the hypothesis through action on objects, synthesizing and analyzing data collected, and using inductive and deductive reasoning, and verifying or rejecting the hypothesis, and then starting all over again or building on what has been learned. The fifth section of this particular experiential approach to learning, or the taxonomy, is valuing, making critical aesthetic judgments, decision-making, self-identifying and self-motivating, and working with others. It also includes cultural pluralism and evaluation or reflection. And the last step is stewardship, eco-literacy, environmental wisdom, non-linear thinking, systems thinking and respecting and taking care of the built, the natural, and the cultural environment. Section 7 is the area where I talk about manifestations for learning or reading the environment, the ideas or knowledge behind all material things. And I'm going to use the heating, ventilation, and cooling as an example. This exercise is divided into messages for enhanced design potential. That's the first area. Then, how can the educator 
use the design potential or the design that is in the environment as a learning tool. And then the third area is the active learning experience or the taxonomy, which is consistent across all the examples. But in this case, it's the HVAC system. So let's look at a few of the enhanced design potential that we might suggest to an architect. Measure the whole cost of ventilation systems over time and maintenance issue, and leave part of a system open to visibility to act as a museum and label the parts. Paint the exposed portion of the duct system color-coded to show the intake and return. Map the duct system. See also recommendations of green design, including the use of solar orientation, solar energy, ground cooling systems, cooling towers, etc. And provide museum-quality displays of wall structure, insulation, and materials. Use non-polluting materials for high air quality and HVAC monitoring systems which are accessible to students. Now, educator, what can you learn from all this displayed HVAC system? That it is a system that is like our body. Building systems are like body systems and we have heat and cooling systems in our bodies. Your students can measure temperature, they can look at thermostats, they can include circulation systems which are related to these building systems and analyze the similarities or differences. Properties of matter, hot and cold, climate, microclimate, heat flow, conduction, pollution, mapping the system, conservation, solar energy, health, air quality, stewardship, mechanics, electricity, sound measurement, and acoustics. They can do diagrams of how these things work and learn about convection and conduction and radiation. Now, in the taxonomy of learning, there's observation and multisensory discovery, data collection, measuring, concept formation, research, research on the indoor pollution, problem solving, diagramming, or making models of the human circulatory system and comparing them to the building system, valuing using the arts to express your favorite season, temperature, and or climate, stewardship, monitor the present results, and apply ecologically responsive HVAC measurement at school and share it with the community. These are just some of the examples for the architect, the educator, and the student taxonomy for learning. In section 7, I would like to mention that the pond or wetland is a great interdisciplinary manifestation for learning, helping with physical education for the kids to build it, or adults, learning about evaporation and flotation in science, using tools to measure even the laptops in the field, graphing data, in social studies, mapping the area and tracing water sources in the area, researching history of the uses in geography, language arts, writing poems, performing arts, presenting findings and displaying projects, studying water for health, the soil quality, testing for pollution, measuring and graphing and counting and collecting for mathematics and fine arts, illustrating and recording sounds of the pond. Now, in New Mexico, there's 5,000 children collecting data on the Rio Grande River, and I think this should happen all over our country. Even the asphalt, which surrounds many schools, can be used as a study tool for looking at the way weeds grow up through the cracks and helping our students to see different kinds of weeds and how they survive even coming through the asphalt. So... There are many, many, many ways to use this environment as a learning tool. Section 8 talks about environmental manifestations that relate to provisioning the environment. Quite often we don't have the kinds of things in our learning environments that are really needed for interdisciplinary learning, so I'd like to just discuss briefly some of the things that we need to think about ordering, some of which schools have, but many times they don't, in the design and visual arts. So let's ask ourselves, first of all, what are the tools in our environment that support learning for language arts? 
We need papers of all kinds, books on design, art, a variety of writing utensils, message areas, letter templates, bookmaking materials, labels, pillows. You know, we talk about literacy, and we have to have literacy everywhere in the environment. What about science? We need objects from nature, magnifying glasses, microscope, jeweler's loops, simple machines, screwdrivers, pliers, hammers, light table. Light table should be in every classroom. Plants and animals to take care of and some lab equipment. What about math? Well, of course, we need rulers, triangles, geometric templates, protractors, compasses, graph paper, pencil sharpeners, erasers, a clock, play money, math, manipulatives, puzzles. For design arts and visual arts, we need student artwork, display space, the miles of hallways in our schools could be galleries, a variety of materials and supplies for creating and building, glue, tape, drawing and painting, utensils, scissors, block. We need in our classrooms, every classroom, a supply place where all these things are constantly available and accessible to children. Performing arts, we need tape recorders or CD players with headphones, props, instruments, set design materials, costumes, stage makeup, mirror, deployable furniture, things that make sound, perhaps with uh, furniture on wheels and things that move around and fold up. We can make the classrooms into studios for theatrical set design. It's almost like theatrical set design or dance or other large muscle materials. We need to get over the idea that a classroom is desks in straight rows or tables in straight rows and non-movable. For health and PE, we need a self-expression display areas, a room for teamwork, flat working surfaces, storage and containers, play equipment, toys, lighting, natural light, safety and equipment. And with technology, we need computers, printers, scanners, digital cameras, access to internet, networks, lab equipment, projectors, robotics, videography, and on and on. Social studies, we need some multicultural realia. I've mentioned a museum before. Craft items, beads, straw, yarn, materials, a globe, career items or tools of the trade, and objects from home that might be culturally significant. So there's a, a list of some of the provisioning kinds of things that it would enhance learning also and should be part of the programming and design process for storing all this equipment. Section 9 talks about a learning environment assessment tool and it is geared around the same continuum of body, mind, and spirit and the habitability levels of health and safety moving within a given space and time, the functional support responding to the design with specific activities, and psychological and aesthetic, the comfort and sensory delight experienced in the body, mind, and spirit continuum. There are 15 items that are accessible, and maybe you can think of even more. Uh, circulation is one of them. Is it easy to read and move through and about? The activity setting itself, is it safe once it's installed? I can't uh, articulate all of them, but I will give you the categories and one or two examples. Structure. What about the structure of the various activity setting. Does it support the activities designed for the student? Is it perceivable and straightforward and logical? Can it be used as a teaching tool? And is it beautiful? Quite often I see classrooms, learning environments that are over cluttered, sort of visual cacophony of visual pollution, and sometimes we need to sort of re-housekeep that environment to keep it simple and easy to read. What about the surfaces? Are they easy to clean? And are they monotextural, not to be confusing? The height of storage, maybe uh, at a certain height, we need to um, use the volume of space, and it should be open and airy and child-related with an overhead plane and the total volume of space used. What about components? Are they easily moved? Lighting, is there a existing natural lighting? And the kind of lighting, we call it full spectrum lighting, 
that doesn't hurt the eyes like fluorescent lighting. And the electrical system, are they safe? Are there enough outlets? I've been in classrooms where the electrical wires are hanging out of the ceiling and just left. The ambient quality, is it all accessible? Are there usable plants and uncluttered green in the classroom? What about color? Is it brought into the room by users? Is it uh, displayed with children's paintings and self-expression? Are there accent colors? Is it light, bright, minimal applications and not too busy? What about storage? Is there adult-directed storage, or is it child-oriented so children can get at what they need and the tools they need to do the work that needs to be done? What about security? Is there lockable storage for items that need to be stored in that way? And are students trusted so that they can have accessible storage without an honor system being reinforced, but reinforced through the environment? Visual access, limited obstructive view throughout the room. Adjacencies, are they interactive or are they accessible to all areas everywhere in the classroom? And then display, is it child oriented and scaled? Is there a framing system and so forth? So um, these are some of the items that we can begin to look at in terms of what it's doing for body, mind, and spirit. In the last section, I would like to summarize by saying that we really need to look at the educational system in a new way. In his movie, Waiting for Superman, David Oppenheimer posits that our dilemma in education lies with inadequately prepared teachers, many of whom are part of the teachers' unions concerned and more interested in protecting their jobs than being professionals imparters or facilitators of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Last month, Arne Duncan, Secretary of Education for the U.S. Department of Education, said in a local newspaper article that if the public wants better schools, it is up to the parents to storm the schools and demand better education for their children. This is not happening on a wide enough scale, he said. Chris Whittle, CEO of Edison Schools, imagines the school of the future where children will be partially to totally learning on their own through technology and other means rather than sitting in structured classrooms, mainly listening to a teacher and it being textbook centered. The Reggio Emilia preschools in Italy believe that the minute a child is born, She or he is strong and powerful, an entity capable of creating his or her path of learning based on inner creativity and the manifestation of that creativity with process and product. My feeling, after 40 years of research on the effects of the physical environment on learning and behavior of students K-12 through and beyond, that what will incrementally improve our educational system is one, programming and design of optimal learning environments that support rather than detract from learning and act as three-dimensional textbooks, if you will. That's a metaphor. Two, the giving of power to students to pursue their own learning and passions. But this necessitates a rich, accessible, environment based on developmental rights, curriculum to be learned, multiple intelligence, and other criteria that are built into the learning environment. The writing and design of new integrated or interdisciplinary curriculum with visual and verbal information retrieval at every student's fingertips is a necessity. This uses the built, the natural, and the cultural environment as a learning tool. We probably need some, in order to execute this kind of new model of learning from the environment, we definitely need our colleges of education to retrain the teachers as technological facilitators and help them allow the students to learn on their own and even bring in some uncertified specialists into the schools to teach photography, architecture, how to fly, and so forth.
Thank you for your attention. I hope this has helped. I look forward to hearing from you if possible. And thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to our podcast today. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge regarding architectural programming for the learner. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Ann Taylor, and to you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you will join us again soon. Please remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org to access other learning events and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the podcast evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.